Charlie Munger has a great quote where he says, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. If you can just make sure your clients don't interrupt it, you've earned your fee forever. This is the Business of Advice podcast, where we help good advisors become great business owners. Hey all, this is a special edition of the Business of Advice podcast. Uh, We've done this a few times before, but at our live events when we have a great speaker here, we wanna take some time to just uh, grab them and have them share a little bit with all of you. And we were honored to have Morgan Housel speak at our Journey event, Uh, just just got done rocking the stage an hour or two ago. So um, we're gonna grab him for a few minutes. Uh, I'll give you a little background on Morgan, partner of the Collaborative Fund, which focuses on supporting and investing in two themes, uh, growth of the creative class and the concept of the collaborative economy. But uh, how I first met and learned of Morgan was his incredible book. If you're a financial advisor and haven't read it, uh, you're doing a disservice to your clients, candidly, but it's called The Psychology of Money uh, and spoke some about that today. So Morgan, uh, excited to have you here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I so appreciate it. Let's jump in. I want to ask you some questions. Uh, some of this will be things that you shared on stage, but not everyone was here. So um, you're, you have an amazing resume in behavioral finance. Like, how'd you get into that? What led you down that path? I started as a financial writer in 2008, which was an, an interesting time to begin that, that process because the world was falling to pieces. Everything yeah. was broken. <laughs> so I spent my first few years as a writer just trying to answer the question, what happened in 2008? And I really just wanted to know what was going through people's heads. How do you explain their behavior during the, the, the real estate bubble and the bust? And I realized that over the years, you could not explain that behavior if you're just looking through the lens of economics or finance. Hmm. There's nothing in an economics textbook that will tell you why people behave the way that they did during the bubble and the bust. But if you were looking at psychology and sociology and politics and history, all these other fields that had nothing to do with investing, those could explain why people did the things that they did. And so that just opened this idea to me that investing was not just the study of finance. It's a study of how people behave with money. And so once I opened that door, and I realized too, as a writer, it's a lot more interesting to people. You can have a lot more fun if you can explain (laughs) investing and finance through the lens of these other little quirky stories that have nothing to do with investing. That's really where it came from. Well, I'd love to talk about the book some because as I said a few minutes ago, right, every every financial advisor should read the book. I think it will help them understand and, and do a better job as an advisor serving their clients. But you have this great quote in your book. You say, uh, people do some crazy things with money, but no one is crazy. Why is that an important concept for an advisor to kind of embrace? I think the idea that everyone is so different and we're all products of our own unique past. And it's so easy for people to look at other people's financial decisions and say, that's crazy. Why are you spending this money on lottery tickets? Why do you invest this way? Why are you saving any money? And it looks crazy through your eyes. But through that person's eyes, it all makes sense. Based off of their view of how the world works and all the mental models that they have, it's checking all the boxes. And I think the idea that something can seem crazy to one person, but it makes perfect sense to another, explains a lot of why finance can be so contentious and why there are so many Mm -hmm. different debates, whether that's between a husband and a wife, an advisor and a client, people on CNBC yelling at each other. A lot of why people don't agree in, 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 in a way that they do agree on meteorology or chemistry, let's say. Why is finance so contentious? I think it's a lot of a lot of it is because we see the world through a different lens based off of our own unique circumstances and experiences in life. So one uh, and just valuable thing that you were sharing on stage, and um, I'll, I'll kind of read a quote from the book, but just to set the stage is, you know, so many of the advisors we work with now are advising people in multiple generations. You know, it used to be maybe kind of greatest baby boomer. Now we're getting into Gen X. So they may be advising people through three different generations. And one of the things you quote a study in your book uh, that says um, it was a couple of economists that found that Our findings suggest that individual investors' willingness to bear risk depends more on their personal history than anything else. Um, Maybe just, that's I I know a big, not even really asking a question, but explain uh, kind of conceptually what that means and what you shared on stage. I mean, if you grew up during the Great Depression, you were scarred psychologically for the rest of your life in terms of you, you probably didn't want to go into much debt. You were probably scared of the stock market. You didn't want to take a lot of risk in your career. You really favored stability and a safety net. That's what you yeah. that's what you valued more than anything else. And someone like myself or you, we can learn about the Great Depression. We can read about it. We can try to empathize. 
but nothing is more persuasive than what you've actually experienced. So when I read about it, it's abstract. It just seems like I'm reading about a different world, which is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so we are all, and that's true for what I've experienced in my life, for what you've experienced in your life. And it's all different. It's different by generation. It's different by country. It's different between me and you. And so we all see the world through a little bit different lens. And we're all just kind of products of who we are. And that's true if you're an advisor dealing with different generations. What a Gen Z has experienced in life is very different from what a millennial has experienced, which is different from what their baby boomer parents have, have, have experienced. Like everyone gets a little bit different view of the world. And every generation has their own defining events, whether that was the yep. Great Depression, World War II, Vietnam, the inflation of the 80s, 9-11, COVID, COVID, which my kids won't remember, even yep. though they're living through it. It's not a part of their adult life. And so every group has a different view of how the world works. It was interesting. We had a speaker uh, a few months ago, Jason Dorsey, who talks about some of these generational challenges. And he said, you know, we're and you're seeing it right now, you know, what they're dubbing this year, the great resignation. And you're seeing this huge um, movement of people in the workforce. And he said, you know, for millennials and below, COVID is that life-defining moment. They've not, you know, they weren't quite old enough during 9-11. And it's just this life-defining moment that's leading to a lot of that. And I think as an advisor, understanding who you're sitting with and what those life experiences are. I think so many of them came up to me after he spoke and said, like, that's one of the most valuable takeaways I had is, like, I have to understand how they think and how they think about money during that. And that's true. Like, every generation has, you know, the older generation says, ah, oh, kids these days. That's always existed. And I think it's just because a new generation who hasn't experienced what their parents have mm -hmm. or experienced the same event like 9-11 at a different point in their life gets totally shaped by it in, in a different way. Yeah, I would say this summer we had a, a family reunion and my, my grandfather is 95 years old, still lives by himself. He's down there with, with my son and some of my cousin's kids that are all about 15, 16 year old boys. And he's talking to them about World War II and telling them some of these stories. And you can just see their eyeballs are like, oh my gosh, I can't, you know. And he was two years older than them when he right. experienced that, you know, it was just, surreal to think about how different every generation can be. Yeah. So, okay, so one of the other things you talked about, uh, and I'll kind of quote it from the book, but I think it's so applicable to what most of our advisors do is that most of them are dealing with people who are, are close to or transitioning into retirement. Um, and here's what you say. You say, my own theory is that in the real world, people do not want the mathematically optimal strategy. They want the strategy that maximizes how well they sleep at night. Um, throwing that out is like, how does an advisor get that message across to a client or, or how should they leverage that in how they're doing their planning? I think, I think there is a push in finance generally that we want to find the quote unquote right answer. Mm -hmm. What's the best allocation? What's the best funds that we should be in? The best stocks that we should buy? Whatever it is. And I just think individually, there is no one right answer that everyone is a little bit different. And you might have someone who is young with a high income that should be 40 or 50% in bonds. Like that, like most of the time, in a, or in a textbook, that would never make sense. Yep. But there's probably a pretty significant portion of investors who are young and have a lot of money who should be in that because they're going to lose their minds when the market crashes. They're going to dump everything anyways. So you might as well start them off in an allocation that embraces who they are. Hmm. And I think it's just, I think that's, it, it, it's, would, for, for most people, it seems like the goal should be, I want to earn the highest returns. That's like the path of least resistance, knee jerk. Of course, that's what I want. But for most people, in reality, after they've been an investor for 10 or 20 years, that's actually not what they should be going for. It's what are your goals? What is your behavior? What is your risk tolerance? And how can we make an asset allocation that reflects who you are? That's good. Um, one, one of the questions I asked you on stage, and the answer was incredible, but I said, if you were an advisor, what are what are one or two of the most powerful questions that you would ask a prospective client? Would you mind sharing what those were, what you shared there? I said it was it was two things. One is I would say, how much is enough money? And a lot of clients would say, that's crazy. What do you mean what's enough? Like there's never mm -hmm. enough. I want more, I always want more. And that's okay. That's not the wrong answer. But it's, it's important to know that about someone, that they have kind of endless ambition and they're never going to be satiated. That's important to know. The other thing is, if you have this documentation or this experience, how did you behave during March of 2020 and October of 2008, maybe 2001, maybe if you were invested back then? What did you do during those periods when the market was melting down? Yeah. Because that's going to be a really good indication of what you are likely to do during the next meltdown. And everything that we know about behavioral finance is that your past behavior is the best indication of your future behavior and that people don't learn from their mistakes. And if you did panic during one of those periods, you're probably going to do it again. No matter what you say that you've learned your lesson, you probably have it. The same emotions and behaviors that dictated your actions back then will come rushing back when the mm -hmm. world is broken again next time. 
And so if you can just use that behavior as the best mirror into your future and just embrace that if you did panic last time, let's put you in a little bit more conservative asset allocation. If you didn't, great, congratulations. Maybe we can take a little bit more risk here. Yeah, I love one of the things you share, and maybe I'll, I'll use this to um, ask a, another question on top of it. But you talked about, you know, the, the, most important, the most important job an advisor has is keeping people on course, right? Trying to prevent them. So if that means you have to go more conservative, put some guardrails around so they don't do that. But then I think a, a second, you, you may share a little bit, bit about that, but then secondarily to that is I think, um, you know, what that allows money to do is to, to stay at work and to compound. And you talked a lot about just the power of compounding. And I think every advisor knows and hears that story, but sometimes I think we even don't give the power of compounding the credit it deserves. And you shared the Warren Buffett example of like his wealth compounding. So maybe just share both of those. Like, you know, how can you um, put some guardrails to keep them from behaving the same way they behaved before if it was not smart? And then why does that make such a big difference? Because it allows that money to compound. I think the biggest thing about compounding, like the simple formula is the exponent is time. That's what's really driving everything is time. And it's returns to the power of time. And the exponent is really what makes all the difference. Yep. And the takeaway from that is that the question most investors want to answer is not how can I earn the highest returns? It's what are the best returns I can endure and sustain for the longest period of time? That's what really makes the difference. And earning a 30% return this year is great. Like that's, that's awesome. You should celebrate that. But earning 10% for 30 years or 40 years, that's like completely out of the park mm. sensational. And so average for a long period of time is really, is, is really where, where the magic happens in investing. Because most people cannot endure and sustain above, above average returns for a very long period of time. If you can be an average returns for an above average period of time, that's indistinguishable from magic in this field. And I think that's really the, you know, that's the I, I'm mostly a passive investor. Uh, it's not because I don't believe in active. It's not because I say no one can beat the market. That's not my view at all. There are a lot of smart investors who can beat the market yep. and will continue to do it. But for me, if I can earn average returns for an above average period of time, I'll probably end up in the top 10% of investors at the end of my life. And that's good enough for me. Not only is it good enough, that's going to achieve every financial goal mm -hmm. I have and then some. So all of my focus, all of my, all of my thinking is just how can I maintain endurance as an investor rather than focusing on what returns can I earn this year? It's how can I stay in the game for as long as, I, for as, long as possible. As you're talking to people today and as you're, you're studying the, like behavioral finance, and, and when, especially when it comes to money, how are some of the things that we're seeing in, in the markets impacting that today? So take Robinhood and AMC and cryptocurrency and some of that. Are you seeing a change in the way that investors are, are taking on risk with some of those that we're seeing in the market? I think the biggest thing is, you know, in March of 2020, we had the, the fastest bear market ever. S&P fell 35% in like mm. two weeks. And then it was over and it surged back to an all-time high almost immediately. And it happened so fast. And during that period of time, last spring, most people were not watching the stock market. Mm -hmm. They were worried sick about their health and how are they going to get their kids to school? How do I work from home? <laughs> Very different from 2008 when it was a financial crisis by definition. That's yep. what people were paying attention to. So, and I say that because for most people, even professional investors, the bear market, the COVID bear market basically didn't. It yeah. does not exist. Yeah. It doesn't really comprehend. And that's very different from 2008 when you had this protracted recession and a long bear market. Very different from the Great Depression where it took 20 years for the S&P 500 to regain its losses. That's the kind of thing where that leaves a mark on society, whereas the COVID bear market didn't happen. And when you talk to investors today, they act and talk like we've been in a 12-year bull market. And I'm going to be like, we had the biggest bear market <laughs> ever, like 14 months ago. Yeah. And it just doesn't even compute. <clears throat> and so I think because of that, usually in a market cycle, you have a big washout that humbles people and changes behavior and pushes out the weak hands, so to speak. This cycle, it didn't happen. And rather than pushing out the weak hands, it like attracted them. Mm -hmm. It just like pushed them all in. Yep. People were like, let's go for it. And that's where you have, during what you would normally have as the washout period, you had the Robin Hood surge of people day trading bankrupt penny stocks. Mm -hmm. Like the exact opposite of what you would expect during <laughs> what was legitimately an economic depression last year. And I think, you know, the longer the bull market lasts, the bigger the reckoning and the more painful the reckoning will be for people. When or if there is another big, huge, protracted decline in the market in the future, if it's been this long since people have had a long decline, 
um, it, it's just going to feel more shocking when it occurs. You know, one thing, a question that got asked of you that y your insights were spectacular, I'd love for you to share them, is they said, with um, the way the government, and I think we both kind of said this, the way the government handled this last crisis is probably the new playbook for how they're going to handle them in the future and just what that does to contracting kind of those bear markets as we see them, you know, whether it's printing money, giving stimulus checks, those types of things. Would you share some thoughts on that? And only because it's, um, and I, I saw this last, you know, March, uh, some advisors tried to time the market with clients and tried to pull them into cash. And then it it jumped back so Ooh, quick that yeah. you were toast. Mm -hmm. If you weren't invested in the market, like there's nothing you can do to make that up. Um, and, and your insights about how those are going to be, you know, shorter and probably shorter was was great. So maybe just share a little bit about that. First thing I would say, I didn't say this on stage, but just remember that right now, Howard Marks, great billionaire investor, last March, um, he raised a big debt opportunity fund to buy distressed bonds, mm. distressed debt. And he raised the fund in like three weeks, which is like record timing for raising a big fund. And at the end of three weeks, at the end of fundraising, all the opportunities were gone. Yeah. It's just like everything <laughs> happens so fast. And I think um, in terms of stimulus and shorter packages, once the government it brings a pile, once the government brings about a new form of stimulus, that becomes the baseline for the next recession. Yeah. And this time in you know last year, we had three thousand dollar checks to every household, double your unemployment benefits, trillions in dollars of QE from the Fed, and that just becomes the baseline for the next recession. It is one thing if the economy collapses and politicians say, nothing we can do. Yep. Completely out of our hands, we can't do it. It's a completely different thing if the economy collapses and people say, hey, you, you are capable of sending me three, a $3,000 check. You did it last time, and now you're not doing it, so I'm going to hold it against you. So I think going forward, every recession that occurs, even a small recession, you're going to replay the 2020 playbook. Start sending checks in the mail, double the unemployment benefits, Fed brings out the howitzers and starts blowing cash throughout the economy. That's the new playbook. And does that mean that future recessions will be shorter than they were in the past? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. It does not mean recessions are going to go away. It does not mean that they will be shallower. It does not mean either of those two things. Does it mean that it's going to significantly reduce the odds of having a five-year protracted recession? Yes, absolutely. So if I, I'm not a betting man, a betting man, I'm not a forecaster. But if I were to assume that over the rest of my lifetime and your lifetime, we have less frequent re recessions, very deep recessions that are short-lived, that would be what I would bet on. It's kind of see, it looks like that's what the trend is becoming as you look over the last you know dec few decades. You also see with COVID last year that when you are in a deep recession. Sending huge checks to be, to people is bipartisan. Both yep. parties come together and say, yep. yep, that's a thing. <laughs> Write those checks. Let's do it. It's because it's very popular. Yeah. No one is going to argue against a check landing in their mailbox. They love it. Yep. So that that once once you show people that you are capable of doing it, that's gonna persist. That's good. Uh, one other thing you shared that I just ask you to maybe or ask the question around. Um, you said one of the most we were talking a little bit about risk analytics and software that can do that. You said one of the most powerful things an advisor could do is show how frequent there are these drops in the market and almost normalize the, the anticipation of, yeah, the market drops, it always drops, it always comes back. Um, maybe share just w what you said as far as like, this is what I would be talking to every client about. I think the best data any investor can look at or an advisor can show their clients is the historic frequency of market declines. Because if you look historically over a hundred year period at how often the U.S. market drops 10, 20, even 30 percent, then what happens the next time? It's not that it's fun and you enjoy it, but you're like, yep, this is pretty normal. And that's when the market falls 20 percent, it's so intuitive to think uh, the, the world's broke. It's over. The, yeah. the market doesn't work anymore. It's permanently broken. The world's coming to an end. 30, 40 percent, that's what everyone thinks. And then if you look historically, though, at how often that has occurred during a period when the market has increased, you know, 500 fold. You're like, look, that's com it's completely normal for the market to lose a fifth of its value yeah. and then recover from there. And you know, the number one goal of, any, of every, any advisor is keeping their clients in the game, keeping them invested. If you, can, if you can keep your clients in the market when it falls 20 or 30%, I think you've earned your fee mm -hmm. for many years to come. That, that's like the most important thing is just stay in the game. Charlie Munger has a great quote where he says, 
the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. Hmm. If you can just make sure your clients don't interrupt it, you've earned your fee forever. And I think the best way you can do that is to get them more familiar with how common it is and normal it is for the market to fall. That's good. Uh, and great, great advice for every advisor to, to take that and apply it to their practice. Um, so I've had you for a while now. And I know you got to get on the road. Can I ask you just some quick lightning round questions? I've asked everyone I sit down with these questions. So um, first one, what lesson did you learn in 2020 that you think you'll carry forward for the rest of your career slash life? People are not good with exponential growth. Hmm. And, and what made you um, learn that? Like, what, what, how'd you... It's so easy to discount the uh, risk of a pandemic early on hmm. because it's not intuitive to think if something doubles every three days where it's going to be a month from now. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's it for policymakers, for citizens, for me, for my family. It's, it's always like that. It was very easy in early March of 2020 to say, oh, like, yeah, there's a, there's a pandemic, but like, it's, you know, it's not that big a deal. And then a month later, the world's completely on fire. Yeah. That's how compounding works. Yeah. It's a good example of compounding. Um, w what's the one thing that you've done over your career to graduate, let's say, from being good at what you do to being great? I only write stuff that I am personally interested in. I, mm. I never try to say, what are other people interested in and what might they like to read? I only write it if, if, if I think it's neat. Mm. And I'm writing for an audience of one, myself. I, I just write things that I think are, are interesting. And then it's a leap of faith that if I think it's interesting, somebody else will as well. Yeah. Well, there must be a lot of people like you out there because <laughs> a lot of people found it fascinating today. Is there anything that you're doing to drive your own personal growth this year that you're excited about? I, I mean, very similar to how I write. I only want to do projects that I really find interesting. And I think that's actually an income maximizing strategy rather than saying like, how can I earn the most money? It's how can I do the things that I actually love to do? Hmm. And if you love to do it, that's when you're going to do your best work. And that's where the biggest money comes from. That's good. Okay. It can't be your book. Um, although, again, highly recommend your book for every financial advisor. But what's the one book that you've recommended most to other business owners, entrepreneurs, financial advisors? During the Great Depression, there was a, a lawyer in Ohio named Benjamin Roth. And he kept a diary during the 1930s, a really detailed diary about just what he was seeing in his, in his town. He was from Youngstown, Ohio. Hmm. And just how the town was dealing with the Great Depression, how people were going out of business, blowing their money, going bankrupt, etc. And he wrote a diary. And his son published it in 2010. It's called A Great Depression, The Diary. And it is the best economics book ever written. Hmm. And the guy didn't even know he was writing. He thought it was just his personal yeah. diary. And it's just such a good insight into how people think during the teeth of panic. And what's really interesting, too, is that he went back in hindsight and annotated it. So he would you know, have an entry from 1932 talking about how bad things were. And then 10 years later, he annotated it. And he was like, oh, here's what I was right about. Here's what I was huh. wrong about. It's really fascinating. I think it's by far the best economics book. That's ever. cool. I'll pick that up. Uh, final question. What's the best single piece of advice you've ever received? I think you've got to learn vicariously from others. A lot of people have made huge mistakes. There's no, there's no reason you need to learn them yourself. Just learn them from others. That's good. Um, do you want to share how people can stay connected with you online? I spend most of my time on, on Twitter. My handle is Morgan Housel, first and last name. The book is available everywhere and uh, on, on, on Amazon, of course. Yeah, I would say go buy The Psychology of Money. And uh, Twitter is where I follow you at, too. So it uh, seem, seems to be the best for kind of content and that being pushed back and forth. So, man, I appreciate thanks you taking much. the time and yep, taking thanks. the time to do this also. Thank, Thank you. you all.